get started. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Bahar. Amen. All right, Phil, would like to start us off. On the morning, on the, let me try that again. On the mountain of Sinai, God communicates to Moses the laws of the sabbatical year. Every seventh year, all work on the land should cease, and its produce becomes free for the taking for all, human and beast. Seven sabbatical cycles are followed by a 50th year, the jubilee year, on which work on the land ceases. All indentured servants are sent, set free, and all ancestral estates in the Holy Land that have been sold revert to their original owners. Behor also contains additional laws governing the sale of lands and the prohibitions against fraud and usury. Right. That is this week's Torah portion. <laughs> we did the 50th year, but this is in more detail. Yes, this is about the 7th year and then, yeah, going on. It's 50th year. All right, so what we're going to be discussing today is loneliness. <laughs> Loneliness in general. Um, it says now, uh, they've done studies nowadays, it says the loneliest generation. You would think, even though we're the most connected generation that there's ever been, the most connected people, you can connect with anybody in the world in a matter of seconds, people are the most lonely today than they've ever been in history. Um, so there's a lot of factors in, uh, in, in loneliness, social media is assumably one of the factors in loneliness. You feel like you have like a friend, but there's actually when I actually have friends on like your friends on Facebook are not necessarily your actual real life friends. Family, uh, the family relationships are eroding a little bit. Um, so they're trying to figure out. People are trying to figure out how to how to make it, how to fix it, how to make it, uh, and how to and how how to solve this problem. So we have one question: Do you think loneliness is inevitable in today's day and age? Anybody have an opinion? No. No. No? No, it's not inevitable. We have I like that answer. <laughs> we have communities. We can have a community. We can have friends. Some people Just... don't have that. Let's say someone lives far away from their community. They don't they don't necessarily have that community. Then you try to. Okay. Right. To do your best to, to do yeah. it. You, you do your best to connect. So if someone feels like they can't change their life circumstances, what would you recommend them do? You'd like to, to, to drive to it or what? any other steps anyone would recommend to do if they would have a, if a, if they help a friend overcome their loneliness? You know I mean? Yeah, that's a good idea. Help other people. How, what, what, would, what would be a concrete step that you would suggest? Um, I would suggest, you know, going, if you have a neighbor, um, making some, you know, bringing something for that neighbor they might need or volunteer to help them. Um, if you can get to a city, volunteer for some kind of service um, in the community. And that way you get right. to know It's all people. great, all great physical go, go, steps to take to that may actually, yeah, it's all go great physical steps that'll help. So today we're also going to be discussing the spiritual side of it. How to how to get less lonely if by becoming more spiritual in our lives. Well, you so, always have a shem if you're spiritual. Yes, right, that's where we're going to get into. Right from the beginning, Torah makes it clear that people should not be alone. It's in the the, it's the very first thing the Torah says is not good is about loneliness. Yeah. So that's a text number one. Ron, would so you like to read for us? Dave. Man, woman. Yeah. Ron, you have yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Text one. Okay, hold on. Let's see. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make for him a helper alongside him. So the Torah acknowledges that loneliness is a serious problem. It's, an, it's, a, it's a big problem. So what's the solution? So this verse in Beration and Genesis gives uh, gives a practical solution. Right, you make human relationships, you know, man and a man and wife, and mm -hmm. have a couple, and then that 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 helps out with loneliness. Practically, you're you're in a relationship with somebody. 
Uh, but again, today we're going to go on to a more inner meaning of this question, right? The more deeper spiritual meaning and meaning to this. So we're going to find the answer to this in this week's Torah portion. Oddly enough, we're going to find it looking through the lens of slavery, right? We talk about the laws of slavery in this week's Torah portion. Um, and we'll find our answer through discussing it that. So towards the end of the Parsha, the Torah discusses the, the, uh, the proper treating of a person who had no means and owed people money, um, whether because he stole something or he owed people money and he wanted to get money. But I, so the person sold themselves into slavery. So the proper term for it probably is servitude because there was no such thing as perpetual slavery for that. Um, right, but the way Torah describes slavery is far away from any description and any any description of slavery anywhere else in history or anything that comes to mind in history. I think in you know, 150 or whatever, 160 years ago when slavery existed here, it was nothing nothing like that. Mm. Right? It well, was, this was revolutionary. It was it was a humane. It was humane. So what mm. what what was it? In text number two. 39 and 36. Well, why does it say 39? It's the it's the it's the verse. It's, oh, it's verse, verse 39 of, oh. of chapter oh, 23 oh, of Leviticus. Yeah. If your brother shall become poor among you and is sold to your you as a servant, you shall not work him as a slave. As a hired servant and a resident of your area, he shall be with you. He shall work with you until the Jubilee year. Then he shall go out from you, he and his children with him. He shall return to his family and to the possession of his fathers. Right, so this is the Torah describing slavery, or again, servitude, that's for, for, for clarity. Does it um, actually say slave? It doesn't say slave. It says, it says slave it. He shall sell himself uh, as a servant. It says so, as an evid. Yeah. But that's also the word for evid is also the word for slave. So it's yeah. it's servant slave. It's it's an interchangeable word okay. there. But then it wasn't pra it wasn't slavery. So what is it, again? How how did it start? Person doesn't have money and just was that had no way of making it, or like has as a debt or something, right? So they sell themselves into slavery. Um, he gets paid basically as a lump sum in the beginning for the value of his time. And then he pays back his debts and he works for his master. The maximum amount of time he was able to work for someone was for six, uh, was for, um, was for, uh, for six years. And then the seventh year he went out. Oh. Now, and technically someone could work if they didn't want to leave after seven, after six years, they were able to tell their master they wanted to stay and they were able to stay until the Yovel, right? Which was every 50 years. But they were actually punished for this. The person Not that wants Jew, to stay. Though. A Jew also. A Jew, if they wanted to stay, if they wanted to continue working in, as, a, as in servitude towards their master, they were able to stay for longer than six years, technically. But, but the master didn't put a hole in his ear. So that's what it was. The, the master put, they would get, they would get, I don't know if the master Jew? did it. That's what he's Jew? talking about a Jew. The reason is because the person says the ear, because they didn't listen when it said that you should only have one master. Right, you'd rather have a master of flesh and blood than have a master of God. Right, you're not supposed to be a servant to somebody. You're supposed to be a servant to God. When you only want to be a servant to someone else, then there's there's a problem here. So you nail their ear to the nail their ear to the door, basically make a hole in their ear. Oh, oh. It's like yeah, you put a piece of wood through their ear to remind them of that. Right, it wasn't what someone was supposed to do. A master could not force someone to stay for that long. It was well, only. It seems like everyone would know what he did. No, it's the point. You're not yeah, supposed to have done this. It's kind of a shaming. No, it's not. You're, it's, yeah. It wasn't the recommended thing to do. Yeah, maybe it was, it was a, a last... deterrent. It's both. It, well, it's, it's a deterrent. It's also supposed to be as a punishment, right? You're not doing the right thing, although it's technically allowed as a. If that's if that's what you want to do, you're not still not supposed to have done. All right, but that's not okay. We'll move on from we'll move on from that. All right, so all the verses here are directed towards the master. It talks about how you have to treat him. It says don't treat him like a slave. So the Torah existed when the Torah was written. It's talking about a practical time of slavery too. There were slaves in Egypt. There were slaves everywhere. They were whipping their slaves. They were treating them inhumane. The Torah is saying don't treat your slaves. Don't treat him like a slave like this. All right, don't make him do this menial, backbreaking labor. 
Um, you treat them like an employee, like a peer, right? You'll sit across the table. There was a difference between the way a Jew would treat a, a, a Jewish servant mm -hmm. and and a slave. Yes, but that even a non-Jewish, even a non-Jewish uh, uh, slave or servant was not able to be treated, was not allowed to be treated inhumanely. It's the same. No, yeah, that's maybe true. it wasn't at the same level, but you're still that you were not allowed to treat someone inhumanely. If you injured them, they went free and all those things, right? It was it was not. <laughs> You still weren't allowed to treat 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 someone inhumanely. It was all about yet. Yeah, you still have to no matter slavery did exist, but it, it was had to be humane, right? There was no there was no uh, there was no there was no like hurting or anything like that, all right? And then finished off when his contract is over, when this Jewish servant's contract's over, he goes back to his he goes back to his family. But it says the Torah ends off with a kind of a puzzling verse. It says he and his children. With him, they shall return to his family. Who's ever talking about his kids? When he got sold or sold himself into servitude, his kids his kids weren't sold with him. So why suddenly is his kids returning to his family with him? Where, where were his children? His children weren't sitting and working for the master before because they were never part of this deal. So why didn't mention the children? So the sage in the Talmud addresses this point. Right, It's always where it's a good, good place to look. If not Rashi, the Talmud has the answer down. That's a text number three. He was a servant? It could be. He got married when he was a servant. Still, his kids would not be... It depends who his wife was, but that would depend whether his kids were servants or not. But it, it explains what it's actually what, what it is talking about. That's text three. Phil, we're going to be... Our sages taught... Get a lot of our hey, sages taught, then he shall go out from you. He and his children with him. Rabbi Shimon said, if he was sold, were his sons and daughters sold? From here, we see that his master is obligated to provide sustenance for his children. You say something similar with regard to the verse, if he is married, then his wife shall go out with him. Rabbi Shimon said, if he was sold, was his wife also sold? From here, we see that his master is obligated to provide sustenance for the servant's wife. And so the servant's children never worked for the master. Still, the Torah obligates this master who bought this Jewish servant to support basically the entire family, his wife, his children. So what does it mean they leave? It means they leave now from the master, they leave the master's obligation to be feeding and supporting the children. When the servant leaves, the children's obligation leaves basically, and he's done with this whole family. Because till now, he had to support the entire family, even though he just bought the, even though he just bought the man in this, in, over here. How does this make sense? He did. He bought a person to help him to help him out in his house, right, or to help out. His the kids aren't helping out. Why is he obligated to, to help out the whole family? So the Ritzva, famous sage, uh, explains what the Torah's logic was. That's in text number four, Ron. We can argue that, inasmuch as every man is assumed to sustain and support his wife and children, the Torah doesn't wish for them to be harmed because of their father's sale. This complete compels the master to sustain and support them. For it is evident in God's eye that had this man not been sold, he would have supported his family. Therefore, the master is obliged to supply them with food and clothing. So definitely in those times and many circumstances today, the the father was the was the breadwinner in the house, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when he got sold into slavery, suddenly and, and and all that money that that he got from it, most of it probably went to paying back his debts. So that was supposed to happen to the wife and kids. So they're just going to be left destitute. So he says no, that they should that they're gonna that that the master has to support them too. But this doesn't really add up at the end of the day. If we're if we're saying that the master has to support the has to has to treat the man basically as an employee. Generally, when someone has an employee, you don't pay child support too, right? If you hire somebody, you don't, you're not obligated to take care of their wife and kids. So why, when somebody is a servant, are you, like, when you bought him for this thing, are you obligated to do his wife and kids, uh, to, 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 to support the whole family? Well, maybe he got a lump sum of money, but... It was. He got a lump in the beginning. But, but maybe it wasn't that much for a period of six years. So a person would be sold to the value of their labor the value of the labor that they would have brought in over the six years that's how it was the, the bet then would decide how much the person was worth in that way 
-hmm. right? It wasn't just a, you say $50, it was, it was an actual amount. And again, it wasn't, it was a maximum time, the six years, right? It wasn't, uh, I think technically they were able to do less too. So and, what? and that money went to that the, money went to person. go paying back or, or uh, most of the time it was because someone I mean, had a debt. It, it wasn't like there was, um, you know, like slaves, they're put on a block and everyone makes money from them. The, the person who they, who's selling them. who oh, No, there wasn't like suddenly them. a slave broker, I think, who's no, doing no it. It was, it, was, it was hopefully a rare circumstance where this happened. So then he would go to the bet then and because the bet then was telling him you have to pay back your friend who you borrowed money from. I have no money. So, okay, look, as a last recourse, you could do this. So they would judge how much he's worth and then they would try to find someone that would pay him for that, for this. So the reason why he has to support the wife and kids, the, 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 the master, is because it's the way that the Torah views children to their parents, that they're an inseparable um, part of the parents. So children are an extension of the parents. Excuse me. Right? And it's all one, it's all one unit. So that's why the master can't just support the by, by the father. You're buying one unit. When you're buying a unit, you can't split this unit in at all. It's just one solid thing. The, 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 the father, the husband comes with the wife and children. Right? That, that's the only idea. So we also see this idea with inheritance. That children are their their the children in Torah are the are the in, I think also in most in, in in general law that children are the primary inheritors of a parent um, because the their children are seen as the living uh, as that they live that they're live the, the, as the living on of the parents right that they're that they they continue on the parents heritage and lineage goes to the children so they're the primary inheritors. So this is how, and here's how one Talmudic uh, commentator explains the mechanics of it. That's in text 5a. We view the child if they perpetuated their parents' death, if they perpetuated their parents' being. Therefore, for example, Jacob would precede Abraham in inheriting Isaac's property because in Jacob's presence, we see his father Isaac as if he yet lived. Right. As in Rashi's commentary on the Talmud makes this point even more clearly. It's text 5b, Phil. Uh, children, <coughs> excuse me. Children stand in place of their parents, and it is as if their parents yet lived. Right. So the Torah views children to parents as one individual unit. Children are seen as carrying on their parents' being. And the status of, of, of a parent is totally inseparable from that from that of, from that of their children. But the parents go, they go, right? It's all it's all one it's all one it's all one full thing. So when the father goes to this master, the whole obligation of, of him supporting his children now passes on to the master because you've got this whole unit, and children are seen as the living being of the of the of the parents. You have to support the children too. And, uh, 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 you, have to, you have to support the children too. And the Rebbe explains this idea even more in text number six. This explains why the master is obligated to support the servant's children. It is due to their association with the father, just as he is obligated to support the father, the servant. So too is he obligated, obliged to, to feed the part of the father that exists in his children. Right, so the Rebbe is taking both these obligations to support the master, to support the servants, support his children into one. It's one obligation. You took upon yourself to support this person. This person includes the entire family. It's not two separate. It's one thing. When you take upon yourself to support him, that that that's what it is. Right, you have to do. You have to support the entire family. So, do, do they live on the property? Or it doesn't do they mean they have to live on the property. Home. They can be living wherever it is. But the master. Mm -hmm. Let's even, if, so if they live there, then he's supporting them as if like as if they're part of the household, I guess. And if they're not, then he's sending them food or money, whatever it is, in order for these children to live till till the father comes back. But the the, the father could live in his own home, where he has to live on the master's estate. I think the master would have control that he would let him live in his home. But actually, it says that if we're going through the humane laws that if the if the per the owner the person that bought it had only one bed. 
it went to the servant, right? That's that that's what the law was, right? That you have to support them almost like equal to yourself. So if you only have one thing, then you have to give it to him because otherwise it's not equal. Right? You have you can't be you can't be better off. He has to eat the same food you're eating, right? If you're having ribeye steaks for dinner, you can't give him, I don't know, like uh cold cuts you know or something uh -huh. like you have to give the same food that you're eating yes. to your servants too right it was all it was basically have to be treated as well. so i assumed that he could control that he would live on his property because he was assumedly working for him then it was probably household duties which would he'd have to live on the property to help to do to do with but um he had to treat him extremely well he couldn't live with his family so that would be i assume up to the the owner whether the, the, the family lived there too i mean if he's supporting them if he's supporting them it might be easier for him to have that the house. Out of house and that's where his family was and he could go and live with his family and then come and in the morning and work on so it. i would think that point would be up to the master the owner at that point at the end of the day he and did sell himself into servitude he did he did fall on whatever i mean there is some there are some aspects of it but he still has to be treated really well and he has to and he has to give the children basically the same thing that he that he give his children, basically treating them all the same. It's kind of like a hired man. Yeah, it's a hired man, and you hired he the entire quit. and you hired the entire family basically. Yeah, and, 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 but he can't quit. He can't quit he until he pay. pays off his debts. Yeah, yes, but years. it's it's not like how it used to be, where you hear there this concept existed um, in the Western world too, or in the world too. But it was there they were being they're treated I mean, you have it nowadays also where people get uh, or whatever some they say it happens when people get brought over uh, brought over the border by the cartels that they have to work off their debt now right and they're not necessarily treated nicely for that this is nothing like that this is where he took on a debt he is stuck there working for the next however many six years but he's being treated as if he's basically the master's peer so he's stuck there, but Whether he's being Jew treated or nicely. Not Jew. Whether Jew or not Jew. Non Jews had to be treated very nicely too. They did not necessarily go free them. Um, but they were obligated to mitzvot. They had a somewhat of an obligation to mitzvot. And if they'd be freed, then they'd become fully Jewish. Right? Actually, there's a story in the Talmud where someone owned a few slaves and they were short of a minion. So they freed uh, two or three of their slaves and then they had a minion. Once they were freed, they're free. Then there's not, there's no going back. It's not like you can say, now you're not free anymore. Now the person is a full Jew. You can't just, not that you could just go pull someone off the street and say that they're a slave today. So he wasn't a full Jew. A non-Jew that went into, that was a, that became a servant or slave to a Jew had certain mitzvot that they had to do, but not every mitzvot. They had similar mitzvot. Uh, they, they were, they had, they, they didn't have to do the mitzvot that were bound by time. Um, once they like were women. freed, yes, similar because they don't because they don't have power over their own time. That's what the idea was, right? Since they're uh, technically a servant to the master, they don't have power over their time. But other mitzvot they were obligated in Shabbat and things like that, kosher. And once someone was freed, then they became a full. They were became a full Jew. The question was when, before mikvah, after mikvah. That was that's more of a tummy discussion. All right, well, let's we'll continue in here. We sit here till 10 30 at night, but the only thing you have to serve here is matzo. You know, we make it hungry. <laughs> We're going to do the this optional section. <clears throat> so, it's also, we can also look into the verse even uh, a little bit deeper now. It says, He shall go back, uh, his children with you, and he shall return to the possession of his father. So, what does it mean he's turned to his father's possession? So, Rashi explains this e even more. That's in text number seven. I think back to Phil. No, Phil just read. Uh, Ron, who we at? Well, I think Phil. Did. Phil. Yeah. Uh, Anybody want to read? Go on. No, Go Phil. Ahead. It's Phil's turn. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Text seven. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm sorry. And to the possession of his fathers, to the respectability of his fathers, one cannot disparage him for his previous servitude. Right, so servitude prevented him from his bond with his family, but never it never severs him from his home. So let's say this family that he was from had a high status in society, or he's just a regular person even. 
you can't just start going and disparaging him like, oh, you used to be a servitude for this guy. So you're not you're not from this high family anymore because of that. Or you're not just part of regular society anymore, right? I never got sold into servitude. So I'm better than you. So if you're saying, no, you can't do that, they're basically go back to whatever previous status they were, to their previous level, to the previous way that they were before this happened. That's how you have to treat them after. Right? You can't suddenly start bringing this up and, and saying that you're worse off. Right? That's yeah, just it's a, like if a person is bankrupt, you don't remind him of his bankruptcy. Yeah, once they get past that, then, then, then they keep going. The previous, okay. Oh, so the, the possession of his father's that's what it means that whatever their parent because generally it was you know there was there was, there was a hierarchy that generally so mm -hmm. um, like in general even in the world nowadays where there's not a monarchy necessarily there are people that have a higher feel like they have a higher place in society or treated differently so it'd be that kind of thing right you can't treat them differently because of so when we're reading this this description of slavery it comes to mind this hasn't this hasn't existed in the last two and a half thousand years right at the, in the end of the day, Jewish slavery is, is, is once the temples were destroyed, basically, once we left the land of Israel, where it doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but this, the reading, if we read more into these verses, um, they find something that they, the mystics and the scholars found a, found a connection with this with our exile today. One of the, the scholars was named by the, it was called the Orachayim. Um, he viewed that these Torah laws as talking about our exile in general, right? And in his reading, it binds the world's governments to treat their Jewish subjects with decency. That's in text number eight, Ron. If your brother shall become poor, etc., this section hints at what the Zohar says that God commanded the ministering angel of Edom, who is the minister of negativity, not to treat Israel cruelly and we are uh, currently exiled to Edom. All right, so in this reading, what's the verse talking about? It's a contract where God obligates to the nations of the world that now that we're, when the Jews are in exile, you can't treat them poorly. Now, if we look to Jewish history, we see that some of them may have uh, violated this contract. Unfortunately, our history is replete with being persecuted by nations. <laughs> so, so it says when Mashiach comes, God will basically take his revenge he will hold these the, he will hold all these nations accountable for what they did over the exile but what's most important in our discussion today is that the parallel between slavery slavery and exile right the law the torah laws that govern that govern uh, servitude or slavery also govern our uh, also govern our exile so earlier we were just talking about how slavery does not break the bonds of a family Right, that the children are always intrinsically connected with with the parent with the parent. So if a father goes into slavery, his children go with him. So that's so that's why the master has to, has to provide for them. So by the same way, it would go the other way, right? If the children for some reason are in slavery, the father would go with would go with them too. So what does this what does this bring to us to that our relationship with God? Many times we speak about God as our Venu, our Father, right? So. And um, and and generally, many times God is referred. We talk to God as a, we talk about God as a father and child, right? You have the entire prayer of Enum Alkanum, right? We're talking about God there as a father and our master, but also as and our king, right? But right, the whole Rosh Hashanah, we're a lot of times talking about trying to refer to God as our father. You know, if you see us as a child, treat us in this way. Right? We talk about God as God as our father. So we see that from this that when we go into exile, God comes with us, right? Our father is coming with us into exile too. And Gemara, the Talmud says this explicitly, that God's presence follows us into exile also. That's in text 9a. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, come and see how beloved the Jewish people are to the Holy One, blessed be he. For every place they were exiled, the divine presence went with them. They were exiled to Egypt. The divine presence went with them. As is stated, did I reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt? They were exiled to Babylonia. The divine presence went with them as it is stated. For your sake, I have been sent to Babylonia. So too, in the future, they will be redeemed. 
the divine presence will be with them as is stated. Then God will return with you, with your captivity. It does not state he will bring back, but rather he will return, teaching that the Holy One, blessed be he, will return with them from among the exiles. And the Zohar, with us. yeah, and the Zohar, famous, you know, the, the book actually written by Rabbi Shun Baruchai, um, expresses this even more. Uh, apropos, we're talking about Rabbi Baruchai, who his yard site, his day of passing is I on Lag Omar, which is this Sunday. Yeah. And we're having a big party this Sunday. You're all welcome to come between 4.30 and 6.30. We went to his grave site. We his yes, grave. it's one of the most visited, generally most years, um, around 200,000 people go up on Lag Omar. Yeah. This year, unfortunately, Due to Hezbollah mm -hmm. deciding that's a good place to shoot missiles to, they mm -hmm. shut it down. There's going to be a small, they're letting up small, a small group, right? Because there's uh, people that have been lighting bonfires there for hundreds, thousands, not thousands of years. So they weren't going to stop that, but they're doing a very small group that's allowed to. It's actually, I think, the Boyana Rebbe who inherited this. He inherited the, the, uh, the main lighting there from his father, basically. So they're letting him go up and light the and light the big bomb a bonfire there with I think ten people. But generally, most years, hundreds of thousands of people go up. There. Yeah, and remember there was a landslide. There was uh, people. Was there was people were trampled. So they were trying to. So they were they're trying to figure out how to figure that uh, how to how to work, make that work with the tons of people that are coming. But this year they had to shut it down regardless because of the threat of Hezbollah shooting missiles there. Um, right, but that we're shim by Chai. Um, so he explained, they explained in the Zohar, text 9b, even more. Phil? <clears throat> so it was taught, fortunate is Israel, for in every place they are exiled, the divine presence is revealed with, uh, with them. So when the Jew, when we went into exile, when the Jewish people went to exile after the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash of the Holy Temple, we went into a new kind of a lonely mode, right? Of being, we're suddenly we're scattered, we're scattered around the whole world, and but God never abandoned us. God was always with us, right? Just as a a, a son uh, would bring his family into slavery with him, God came with us into 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 exile. And the rabbi expounds on this even, even more and points out that God's presence is not just there and protects us from afar. He's actually with us, right? Whenever we're going through anything, God is there with us actually, not just viewing it from afar. The rabbi explains in text number 10, Ron. Simply protecting the Jewish people and every Jew individually during exile does not require the divine presence to be with them. The same holds true of God's ability to redeem us from exile, as in, like the days of your exodus from Egypt, I will show him wonders. Even if the Almighty had remained in the heavens, allowing himself absolute freedom, he could have directed the world and protected the Jewish people everywhere. God is always the guardian of Israel, who neither slumbers nor sleeps. And he provides for all their needs as he as he nourishes the entire world in his goodness with grace, kindness, and mercy. Grace after meals. This alone would hasten our redemption. Hello. Yeah, continue. Oh, oh that's the Pretty second page. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but Rabbi Sh Shimon Bar Yochai says that God's love for the Jewish people makes this impossible. While they are in exile, the Almighty cannot allow himself to be in any state other than in exile with them. The Jewish people's experience of exile distresses him, as it were, for in all their pain, he was pained, which means that he limits himself to their level of freedom. He is even present in their downfall. And he is there to live through, as it were, everything the Jewish people live through in exile. Rabbi Shimon goes even, goes even a step further, stating, for every place they were exiled, the divine presence went with them. This means that God 
is as, as it were situated in exile so much so that the divine presence went with them subject to the exact circumstances of exile that the jewish people face is there more All right so the rebbe makes it clear that the, what the talmud and the zohar are talking are not, are not I'm talking about in metaphorical terms right it means in the truer sense that like god is contains himself to the circumstances of the jewish people when we're in exile when we're suffering god is there he's suffering with us and the rebbe expounds it develops the idea even more and Clarifying that it also holds true to God's presence in every individual person. It's not just a general thing that God's with all the Jews. He's with every single one of us. That's in text number 11. This is true not only of the Jewish people as a whole, but of every individual Jew. In every place where a Jew is found in exile, in every land, whether outside the Holy Land in the United States or elsewhere, or even in our holy land where exile's effect is deeply felt. In every city, in every neighborhood, on every street, even far in the hinterlands where a single lonesome Jew is exiled. Together with that Jew, in every situation and circumstance, we find the Almighty. Right, so God is immediately present in every individual Jewish person's life, in everybody's life. When we hurt, he's hurting with us. When we rejoice, he's rejoicing with us. Right? Not just watching from afar, God is actually experiencing it all it all with us, right? No matter where we may be. So there's many reasons why someone may feel lonely, feel lonely in this world. Right? You might feel alone. You might feel like there's no one to you don't have enough people in your life to connect to. You might be unable if you're more of an introvert, it's harder for you to connect with people. Right. And this, uh, so the circumstances that Generate loneliness may be a permanent thing, may be temporary, just at the moment I have no one to talk to. Loneliness doesn't discriminate, though. It could be young, it could be old, it could be a charismatic a person, a simple person, a wise person, um, rabbis, you know, anybody. So one of America's, one of the leading rabbis, uh, his name was Rabbi Yasha Bear, Rabbi jo Joseph uh, Soloveitchik, he wrote a classic book on the subject that's called The Loneliness, The Lonely Man of Faith, where he writes in detail uh, the loneliness that he felt in his life. He was one, he was the rabbi of uh, one of the rabbis in Shiva University, very famous, yes. uh, very famous rabbi in America. And his son is famous too. Yeah. So uh, that's in text number 12. Phil, I think we're back to you. Yep. Uh... I am lonely because at times I feel rejected and thrust away by everybody, not excluding my most intimate friends. And the words of the psalmist, my father and my mother have forsaken me, ring quite often in my ears like the plaintive cooing of the turtle dove. All right, so of course, practical steps and natural means could alleviate the problem. Right, and then for sure we should go after these things. Shouldn't just try to rely on, you know, on, on anything else happening. But we have a safety net here. Judaism gives us a safety net. Torah gives us a safety net here, right? Even if we can't find a single physical human to connect to. In Psalms and Tehillim that mentioned above, David Amel King David describes the loneliness he felt when he was deprived of any human connection. But then he also talked about the antidote to this that was available that we should all try to adopt in our own lives. That's in text number 13, Ron. For my father and mother have forsaken me, but God will gather me up. So even when he was alone, David and Malachi and David found comfort in the fact that God, in God's presence, and he was never truly alone. So there's a famous parable, the parable on this, that there was a very wealthy man who found himself in, later in his years where he had no family, he had no children. And he, like, he didn't want to just die with all his money, right? And like, you it would just go to waste that. So he figured he's going to go find someone uh, on th that uh, find someone that's similar to him that doesn't have family, doesn't have uh, doesn't have children, doesn't have friends, but is poor that doesn't even have the physical off and can give him all give him give him the money. So searching around, he managed to finally find someone, and he says, "Here, I'm happy. I, I want to help you because you have no one." And I says, "You want to help me because I have no one? But I'm not alone. I don't have no one. I have God. That's why you want to help me." Um, if that's why you want to help me, if that's your reasoning, 
then I don't want then I don't want to take it, right? Because today I might be poor. Today I might have today I might have no money. But God can always change that tomorrow, right? He can always, God is with me and he can always change that. And my circumstances can always change, right? I can't say I have no one at all. So the rich man's like, okay, you're a little bit crazy. I'm offering you tons of money. You don't want to take it because of this. Fine. So he goes and he, he can't find anyone. He despairs. He just buries his money on one of his estates. Years go by, a few more years go by, and the rich man ends up losing everything, right? And now he's a destitute poor man. So he remembers, I have this money I buried on this estate. So he goes there and he starts digging in the man that bought the estate finds him, some random man digging on a state, and brings him before a judge. He comes before the judge. The judge asks him, do you recognize me? He says, no. He says, I'm that poor man that you wanted to give all your money to. And look, God was with me. God was, I was there. I was never alone. And, and my circumstances at the end of the day changed. Right? I trusted in God. And when you have God, you're not truly ever alone. And I managed to build myself up. All right? So just as loneliness could be universally felt, um, every one of us could also access the comfort that access this comfort, which comes with seeing that God is, is, is with us and accepting God's love that he's always, that he's always there with us. But knowing this is just one thing, right? Knowing, and, and knowing something that God is always there. We always know that God's everywhere, but allow is, is one thing, but allowing this knowledge to actually change our feelings is a whole other thing, which takes a lot more work, right? To actually know that actually let something we know that's actually there. We can't physically feel at the moment. Change our lives takes a lot more, and we have, it takes a lot more uh, meditating and, think, and thinking about it. But when we get there, it actually gives us the strength to keep going because we know God. God is always with us. Rabbi Soloveitchik opened up his, this uh, opened up his essay by saying that I am I am I am lonely doesn't mean that I'm alone. You could be surrounded by friends and family. You could be family. You know anybody would still feel lonely. It still feel lonely inside, right? Because he feels he can't fully share, even though he's surrounded by people, people that he might be able to talk to, he still feels a little. He still feels lonely inside. Many of us have actually, many of us have actually experienced this this, this feeling once in our lives, or uh, more than once in our lives. Um, right? We could feel that the people around us were not fully present with them, not fully present with us. But being aware of God's presence and manifesting this in our lives. That could get rid of this loneliness because we're not we're not alone at the end of the day anymore. Well, now we have God with us. He's such a brilliant man. So he's he, he, he's writing that. Now he's he's writing. He felt alone, and it continues on that how this is this is how he basically got over it. That God was God was with him at the end of the day. Oh. Right? It wasn't to say that he was lonely and that was it. He opens up with that, but he's saying that that because God is with him in his life, it helped it, it helped him out. Well, yeah, I think David. It was, it was the same thing for yeah, the God. He, yeah. said, he says, he, everyone has forsaken me, but God was always with me. At the end yeah. of the day. But that's true because everyone is just a human being and they have their own needs. And, and mm. Yeah, at the end of the day, people are human. And they, they may be there, but they might not be fully present. But when God is there fully present for us, Right, God is always there for us, and it's a true level of connection of friendship with God. He's there fully for us. Right, and we have this deep connection. That's the deepest level of companionship. So a young man actually once wrote to the Rebbe, and he feels lonely. He feels like he's feeling this loneliness. So the Rebbe acknowledges feelings, and the Rebbe challenged him to adopt um, a deeper view on reality as the key to overcome. So that's in text number 14. And we're back to Phil. What, in fact, is loneliness? At this very moment, behold, God stands above you, and through the whole earth, and though the whole earth is full of his glory, he scans your mind and heart to see whether you are serving him properly, as Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Ladai informs us in Tanya chapter 41. In that same chapter, Rabbi Schneer Zalman immediately leads us to the logical conclusion of this. If so, one ought to serve him, and one ought to meditate deeply on this thought and, and at length, etc. If you put an effort meditating on this conclusion, you will immediately see that you are not lonely. Quite the contrary. And the letter actually goes on. The Rebbe encourages this man to go out and spread Torah, spread Chassidut, which will help him alleviate his loneliness also in a physical way, like going out and meeting and talking to people. Hmm. 
but this was the prime. This was the first thing. Like this was the primary thing. Once you get the thought in your mind that we're not alone, that God is there, to help alleviate your loneliness. Right, but it's not easy. It's not easy to live up to. Right, we live in a reality of exile where we don't see a physical man. We don't see physical godliness in front in front of us. Right, it's 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 sometimes difficult to to see God's presence and to peel back these layers these layers of exile and darkness that that are that are on top of it to be able to see that God's there with us. But when Mashiach comes, when Mashiach comes, we we'll pray for every single day, then we'll be able to see this in a more physical, manifest way. It'll be easy. To, to realize that we're not lonely, that God is always with us, to be able to see it in a more, again, in a more manifest way. When and there won't be any more lonely people because you're able to see that God is with you. Well, when the temple was, people could feel it then. In the temple. Yeah. It says in the temple itself, there was more of a feeling of God. Outside the temple, so it may have been a more spiritual world at that time in Israel, but it wasn't as, it wasn't the same as when Mashiach comes, where there's going to be even a, even a more revealed level of godliness, not just in the temple itself, it will be everywhere. So before we conclude, we're gonna, oh, there's, I'd like to suggest a, a, a uniquely uh, um, Jewish kind of loneliness. Right? Throughout history, the Jews have always had, we've had a little bit of a lonely path. We've been one small nation and you know, going through living in different, other, in other people's countries. So the positive side, we, they, we stood up and we stood up for a commitment of Judaism. We came through all these thousands of years still as a nation where many of their nations got swallowed up. Right? We stood as a proud nation still after all these years with our Torah, our traditions, and our heritage. But on the flip side, we always kind of felt a little alone in this cold world, right? We, we didn't feel like we belonged in, in all the other countries that we lived in. So in Devarim, in Deuteronomy, there's a verse that describes how God that shepherds the Jews through uh, through history alone. That's in text 15a, Ron. God led them alone, and no strange power opposed them. So on one level, this verse describes how our fate lies in God's hands alone, right? God is the only one. But if we read deeper into this, into uh, on another level, it talks about how the Jews are destined to walk alone in their singular commitment to God, right? We're fully dedicated to God and to, only to him that we're alone in this also. Um, and this is how the, here's how the Kli Yakar, another famous uh, famous commentator on the, on, the, on the Torah, explains this idea more in text 15b. Alone refers to the Jewish people, for he distinguished them from the peoples to be a people exclusively devoted to him. Right, so in effect, the Kliyakar is explaining what uh, the positive side of our historical loneliness. When Mashiach comes, we're not we're not we're, we're not going to only see the elimination of loneliness as a painful thing in our in our lives. We're going to see the concept of loneliness morph into a positive aspect, right? That we were lonely in the world only in serving God, and this is going to be and and what what's the benefit of this? What's the benefit of this being alone? It's a unique connection with God. It's a unique relationship that we have with God because we had the single individual purpose of serving him, right? And it's a unique awareness that we have from all these years of, of working through it. So in today's world, this positive awareness that we're, what, what does it mean that we're alone in this world is that we're serving God in this individual lonely way, so to speak, gives us the, the gives, it should give us the strength to be able to overcome the negative trends, which push, push us away from it. And, and and come as a positive level of light where we have to re, to realize reorient ourselves towards our mission and see it in the what this this lonely way in the positive and make it that our that we continue to serve God in the best way possible and that will bring this loneliness of us alone in this world into good and again it has also to do with that God is always with us we see that God is always with us then we're all, then we're gonna to want to serve him in the, the proper way possible and serve only him. That'll again bring us to this. And as I said before, it's again this place is Shani today, so it's not too late if you feel like uh, you haven't started this yet in your lives, which I'm sure you all did. But if anybody's watching this recording later and has not, again today was Pesach Shani, and it's never it's never too late to reorient ourselves and to into the correct path and to serve God and to make this world a better place, which God willing will bring to the uh, final redemption 
where we could see God physically and, man and physically manifest, which will happen with the coming of Shia and the building of our third and final temple. Oh, God. Oh, God.